Hello everyone. Welcome to our weekly recap of our chronological reading through the Bible, following the chronological presentation that is found in the Reese Chronological Bible. This is week number 12 that ends on March 26 today, 2022. We began the week's reading in the midst of a bizarre and sad and terrible story about a Levite and his concubine and uh, who had been abused and died uh, by men of the tribe of Benjamin in an area called Gibeah. And we began this week's reading learning that uh, these particular men were going to be uh, brought into uh, judgment. And the sad thing that we discovered is because the people who had done these atrocities and uh, immoral acts and terrible sin were not dealt with. Before it was all said and done, 65,000 men in the armies of Israel died uh, to make uh, justice happen because of what had taken place. It was kind of a bizarre story and uh, it's one of those heavy reading stories that we uh, started the week with. And the decisions that were made by the people even after that battle was over in order to not have one of the 12 tribes of Israel disappear or no longer exist. Uh, the provision that they made for the remaining uh, survivors of that tribe of Benjamin to take wives and and uh, raise families and and refurbish the numbers, so to speak, of their tribe was even suspect. And so we finally got to some fresh air on the next day's reading when we came to the story of Ruth, a four chapter book in the midst of the book of Judges or the time of the Judges uh, in the Old Testament. They had been into the promised land now for a couple hundred years or so. In fact, uh, one of the things that uh, I like to consider is that the uh, time in which we started this week's reading was uh, based off of Reese's chronological dating was around 1315 BC. And when we come to the end of this week's reading today, it's around 1094 BC. So just a little over 200 years of time elapsed in this week's reading that we have uh, done. And, but we came to this book of Ruth and it's one of my favorite books in the Old Testament. It's a tremendous book that gives a, a bunch of typologies or foreshadowings of things that are meaningful to you and I uh, concerning salvation and prophecy and uh, the city of Bethlehem and uh, family of David and a whole bunch of things like that. If you'll recall the story, there was the main characters were Boaz who owned uh, some fields and apparently was a very successful businessman. He became the kinsman redeemer for both Naomi, who was a Jewish lady who had gone with her husband and two sons during a time of famine away from Israel, uh, out of the land into the land of Moab. Her two sons married Moabite women and her husband died and then her two sons died and she was left there in the land of Moab with her two daughter-in-laws who were Moabite girls. And then Naomi discovered that the famine had uh, gone away and that there was now food and uh, crops in the promised land. And so she determined to go back there and encouraged her two uh, daughter-in-laws to stay there and to find someone else to marry and to raise a family. One of them did that, but the other one, Ruth, told her that where she went, she would go. Her God would be her God and she would die where Naomi died. And there was just a tremendous love and uh, compassion there that Ruth showed to her mother-in-law, Naomi. So they went back to the land of Israel. And there we find this typology of all sorts began to uh, take place. Naomi represented the nation of Israel. Ruth represented or was a typology of the church which is predominantly uh, Gentile, uh, certainly in our day. Boaz uh, was a type of Christ, the kinsman redeemer. 
and Boaz's servants became a type of the Holy Spirit in that we're never given their names and they're the ones that introduced uh, Ruth to Boaz and Boaz to Ruth. So there's tremendous typology there and in the area of salvation, Jesus became our kinsman redeemer. Boaz became the kinsman redeemer for Naomi and Ruth. And in the process of that, uh, he married Ruth and uh, became, uh, Ruth became his Gentile bride. Naomi, representing the nation of Israel, had her land restored to her. And uh, even the city of Bethlehem came into play because that was the place where Boaz lived and had his land. And that was where the story took place when Naomi and Ruth came back from the land of Moab. And we discover at the end of the book that the descendants of Boaz and Ruth uh, went on down and became King David. And uh, then, of course, the great descendant of King David in his line was the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that little book of Ruth gives us our first tie of the city of Bethlehem to the Lord Jesus Christ. So uh, just a tremendous story, and it was a really a breath of fresh air after having gone through that previous, previous bizarre story. So I always enjoy that uh, particular book of Ruth and the story behind it and the symbolism that it shows and the foreshadowings of things uh, fulfilled by Christ and uh, the New Testament. Then we came to this uh, story about Deborah and Barak uh, leading as judges over the nation of Israel. And uh, Deborah was a prophetess, we learned, and that she told Barak to lead the armies of Israel into a battle. And he said that he would do that as long as she went with him. Well, she agreed to do that, but she said, if I do this, then the glory of the victory will not go to you, it will go to a woman. And sure enough, uh, Sisera, uh, the uh, the head of the army for uh, the Midianites, uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, the enemies that they had, was then uh, defeated, but he was defeated and put to death by a woman named Jael. And uh, he went into her tent to hide from the armies that he was fleeing from, from Israel. And uh, the Bible's quite descriptive. It says that uh, he laid down to sleep and uh, she ran a tent peg through the temple of his head, nailed him to the floor of the tent. And so she was given the glory of that particular victory. Then we learned that the roller coaster ride for the spiritual well being, or not so well being, of the nation of Israel continued. Uh, they were disobedient again, and God allowed the Midianites to come in and to rule over them. And then, after a period of time, Gideon was raised up. To, to lead the army. And we saw that great story of how he started out with uh, around 30 some thousand men. And God told him that was too many. And uh, through a couple of different processes, he had the army whittled down to just 300. Uh, then God was able to uh, provide the victory because when God does things like that, he wants to make sure that it's in such a manner that he gets the glory and not man. So there was this story of Gideon uh, defeating the Midianites with his army of 300. Then uh, we discovered that Midian, or, uh, Gideon had a son by a concubine named Abimelech, who himself uh, did quite an atrocity in killing all of his half-brothers. He thought there was one that escaped, and Abimelech became uh, the leader and the men of Shechem uh, were the ones that were behind him and supported him. <coughs> that one half-brother that escaped pronounced a curse against him. And after a period of time, God brought about uh, the uh, contention between Abimelech and the men of Shechem. And it resulted in all of them being judged by God and being destroyed. And we come to this uh, woman named Hannah, who was married to Elkanah. And she was a second wife, and she was barren and had no children, and the other wife did have children, 
So Hannah felt despised, and this was during the time when the tabernacle was in Shiloh. Eli was the prophet, or the, the priest rather, and recognized as the leader. And Eli had a couple of sons that were no good. And so the story begins to unfold how that Hannah prayed to God for a child. And uh, Eli told her that her uh, prayer would be answered. And sure enough, a year later, she gave birth to a, a son named him Samuel. And she had promised and made a vow that if God would uh, take away her barrenness and give her a son, she would lend him to the Lord for all of his life. And what we'll come to find out is that she fulfilled that vow and promise. And when he became weaned, old enough to be weaned, she took him to the, to the tabernacle in Shiloh to be raised under the tutelage of Eli the priest. But uh, in between uh, some of these times, it's kind of like a, a television show or a movie or something. We change from scene to scene, especially in the way that uh, Reese presents these chronological passages in his presentation. So we come to this uh, story about uh, Samson and some of his exploits. And after that, we come back to the story of Samuel and the storyline and how that uh, after Samuel was weaned, Hannah took uh, Samuel to the tabernacle and she offered up a prayer. The first 10 verses of chapter two of 1 Samuel. And the amazing thing about that prayer was, if you happen to notice, she didn't ask for a thing. There were no petitions that she made of God in her prayer. In fact, it sounded more like what we would read uh, in the book of Psalms, when a psalm writer would just offer up several uh, verses of praise to God. And uh, it's a tremendous uh, prayer. Uh, she, uh, I have uh, thought so much about that prayer that I have memorized it. I think that I'll pass on trying to recite it here because of uh, even the pressure of being by myself in this room and looking at the, the camera. I think I would mess up and I don't want to do that, but it is a tremendous prayer and I would encourage you to go back and read it again. It's the first 10 verses of the second chapter of 1 Samuel and I'm always impressed uh, that she asks for no things from God. She felt like she had already been given an answer to her prayer and her prayer just was nothing but praise to the Lord. Well then after that, we go back to as we draw our reading to a close for the week, we went ben back to this man Eli and his two worthless sons. And uh, we discovered that God called Samuel in the middle of the night. Samuel did not yet know the Lord and he thought that Eli was talking with him. And he went in and woke Eli up and said, you called? And he said, no, go back. And so that happened a couple of times and Eli was then smart enough to realize that it must be God that was speaking to Samuel. And he gave instruction to Samuel to go back and to, when he heard the voice the next time, say, uh, your servant is here, Lord, or something to that effect. And then God gave him some information that was about the nation of Israel and specifically uh, Eli and his two sons, that they would be uh, judged and put to death Eli would be judged because he didn't discipline his two worthless sons and his two worthless sons would be disciplined because of their own actions and deeds. And so then there was a war between the Philistines and the Israelites and uh, they were having difficulty in the war and decided if they took the Ark of the Covenant uh, to the battlefield that that would bring about victory for the Israelites. They did that. Hoff, or, uh, Eli's two sons went with the Ark and the result of it was the Philistines uh, killed his two sons and defeated the Israelite army. And when news about that came back uh, to where Eli was in Shiloh, he was sitting there by the gate uh, on a stool or in some high seat. And the Bible says he was a, an obese man, a heavy man. And we get, when he got the news that the Ark of the Covenant had been taken by the Philistines, it's as if he couldn't take any more and he fell off of his seat backwards and broke his neck and died and there was the consummation of the judgment upon Eli and his two worthless sons. And 
of the Ark of the Covenant is now in the land of the Philistines for a period of seven months as we drew our reading for the week to a close today and we discovered that God brought about great judgment upon the Philistines because of that and gave them great uh, physical maladies uh, of the, what the Bible refers to as emeralds. And when we pick up our reading tomorrow for the beginning of next week, we'll see kind of another bizarre story how the, the uh, Philistines seem to have a little bit better uh, thought process about uh, dealing with that Ark of the Covenant and they're going to send it back to the Israelites and kind of uh, put a fleece out somewhat. We read about the fleece that Gideon had this week and they're not calling it a fleece but they're going to uh, make some provision for the <clears throat> Ark of the Covenant going back to the people in Israel and however that comes about they will determine in their own mind whether it was from uh, the doings of the God of the Israelites or not. And then we'll discuss, or discuss next week, uh, recap about why in the world didn't they, if they had that uh, level of insight, why didn't they just forsake their own idols and follow the God of Israel? But they didn't do that. And we'll read about that next week. So I hope you're enjoying reading through our chronological journey from Genesis to the book of Revelation, from Genesis to eternity following along the Reese Chronological Bible's presentation of Scripture. And uh, again, if you would like to have the reading material, if you'll contact me, I'll try to see that you get that. Uh, you can email me at reader66 at gmail.com. Father, thank you again for this week's reading and the time that you've given us to spend with you and uh, fellowshipping in your word and reading and meditating on it. Help us that we might learn to apply these spiritual lessons that we see from the Old Testament stories to our lives so that we might avoid the chastisement or judgment that came upon these people because of their disobedience. Thank you for your word and the promises in it. Thank you for those who join us online and that are reading along with us in our chronological journey. We ask for your blessings upon them and we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I hope that you have a good Lord's Day tomorrow. Enjoy fellowshipping with other believers. Uh, hang in there and stay up with your reading. And remember that if you stay on track with your reading, we'll be through the entire book by the 16th of November. And this is approaching the end of March. So we could basically say that we're about a third of the way through already. So hang in there. and. Uh, until next week, Lord bless you.